This was the first time leaving the UK to come here, so I have to say um, thank you to Tiuvin, especially thank you to Pia Braulo and Ernst and the team here who made this possible. Um, but I'm saying that not just to be gracious, thank you, not just to be gracious and to say thank you, but also to explain why I'm absolutely crapping myself. I'm so sorry, I'm really, really, really nervous. I haven't stood behind a lectern for a long time. So if I pass out or start crying, I'm sorry. Um, but I'll try not to. Um, it's been quite the day. Um, I've been so lucky to be in the company of so many eminent scholars and people who are much more experienced than me. Um, and it's been you know, a wonderful privilege to be able to hear so many different perspectives. Um, just going to time myself. I'm not going to take a huge amount of your time. Now, I know we've had a whole day listening to and looking at quite a lot of um, material on um, Fischer von Erlach himself, but also on many, many questions around architecture, architectural production, cultural conception, um, and you know how we position ourselves in the world, which is quite a lot for a one-day conference. So I'll try and keep this, uh, I hope you forgive me for keeping this as a bit of a sorbet. Um, as well as forgiving my nerves. So it's going to be short, and then we'll get to the headline act of, of uh, Mr. Czech, who's freshening up, I guess. Um, OK. Uh, we'll start with some stories. I'm, I'm not an architect, nor a Fisher scholar. I think I'm the only brown girl in the room. Look, I'm in, I'm in costume. I just want to um, show you the position from which I'm approaching this. It's of someone who's not a practicing architect, not actually interested in putting design out into the world. I'm quite liberated from that. Uh, <laughs> um, but stories, yes, infinitely interesting. All right, so um, let's start with a bit of story. Um, I'm going to keep interrupting myself, but I'm gaining courage from Manuel Hertz's presentation, where you were so generous with your personal narrative, as well as music tastes and gig uh, stories and so on. So I'm encouraged to include a bit of my own story. I was born in Middlesbrough, which is a really industrial town <laughs> in the north of England. And then we moved to India when I was a very small girl, and we moved back. So my sense of identity, both as a sort of person who's been working in architecture for about 20 years, but also not an architect, and someone who's been living in England for much more uh, of my life than in India, but is not English. Um, and someone who, when I went to live in India, was not considered Indian either. Um, when I came back, I was about 12 years old, when I came back from India to England, I remember um, the mother of a school friend very excited to make me a curry. I guess she wanted me to feel at home. And she put in this curry four apples two cartons of double cream, neither of which are available in India, green apples, you don't get those in India, and um, several bananas, and it was nothing to do with what I recognized, and coconut, um, lots of coconut. It was nothing to do with what I recognized as a curry, or what has been known as a curry, but it was an interpretation, no, an appropriation, and something that was done with a lot of love. Um, and those are the things that I'm kind of thinking of when I think of Fisher and when I think of my reaction to um, the Antwerp. Um, more recently than that, 2016, I think, was the, not the penultimate time I went to India, but maybe one before that. And um, it was, of course, on the eve of Brexit. And I was hearing a lot from my relatives. In fact, growing up in India, I heard a lot from my relatives about how English people must be and how difficult it must be for me to grow up in England. And it was on me to say, no, that's not true. <laughs> you know, most people are great, and English people love India, and you guys are laboring under some kind of colonial burden where you, know, you, you feel that I must be seen as subservient when that's not the case, not the case in my experience. And then after Brexit happened, I had to change my mind. <laughs> I realized that I was quite wrong. And it was another um, moment of slippage of identity, slippage of, uh, let's say, belonging, and maybe even a right 
you know, I remember for about a week after Brexit leaving the house with sunglasses on because I just wasn't sure what kind of reaction would happen. Um, I don't mean to make this too personal. This isn't a personal narrative. It happens all over the world. It's happening now with many displaced people even in this country who are not really sure whether they belong. We're also not really sure whether we belong. Um, OK, I'll try and move on a little bit from that. So um, I've talked a little bit about my lack of courage today. Um, I was Courage is perhaps the thing that struck me the most, looking at um, Fisher von Erlach's Antwerp. Um, again, I'm not, I'm not actually going to show any Fisher images. You've seen a lot, and you'll probably see some more. Um, but I was trying to find somebody or some place with a similar level of audacity, I think is what I'll use. Um, I think audacity is the term that I uh, settled on between um, liberty and bravery. Because initially when I was thinking about this gentleman in 1721, who's drawing as, as truthfully as he feels to be factual, Iranian architecture and Chinese architecture. I mean, I remember when I was training as an oh, architectural historian, writer, pretender, um, taking a vow that I would not write about a building unless I'd seen it. I would not write about a building unless I'd visited it. And so the sheer audacity of uh, Fischer von Erlach talking about the world, not only inserting his own architecture alongside, um, let's say, a sort of imagined greatest hits, um, it just struck me as um, improbably brave or potentially with some kind of liberty. And I guess, um, rather than arguing for either position, I, I wanted to ask, will you and all of us, that question in terms of what kinds of liberties we allow ourselves as makers of space um, and as kind of synthesizers of meaning. So, I mean, I was looking back into uh, cultures that I'm slightly more familiar with. I could not find a map, an illustration, a story, um, Maybe there are scholars in this room who could help me, but I couldn't find in Asia um, too many depictions of what things must be like elsewhere, whether that was either critical or kind of um, elegiac or, or somehow, somehow celebratory. I didn't find one. Mostly what I would find in um, Asian visual histories, not that, I, not that the archives and the scholarship is as robust as it could be, that's something that I hope to address in my lifetime. But I could find these kind of cosmological images which talk about different planes of existence, but not different peoples. Different planes of existence, I suppose, again, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what kind of liberties or permissions people allow themselves to imagine that things are structured like this and what kind of implications they have. On the right-hand side is a very early map of the world. I think that comes from China around about 1420-something. Um, difficult to date uh, the kind of images that I'm finding online. But um, again, it's not one where a sort of knowledge, a factual knowledge, is being assumed by the author, rather a fantastical proposition. And again, these were questions that I was holding in my mind when I was looking at um, the Entwurf. Are these fantastical propositions? Are they propagandas within which to insert Fisher's own work? Or are they um, something else? And I don't know, it seems odd to me that this notion of audacity, maybe I'm being overly sensitive, please tell me. Um, <laughs> I'm not used to these kind of 1.0 discussions, but maybe I'm being overly um, strange about it. Just what gives someone the courage to draw what they don't know and what is received from yeah, I mean, I'm sure that there was a lot of work researching the available documentations of travel and so on. But um, again, the audacity of it is, um, I don't mean that in a critical sense. It's, it's again, quite liberating. Um, so from there, oh, this, was, <laughs> this was one instance of a kind of appropriation, I suppose. This was a, an Indian folktale about good and evil being told in Iran, I believe, or Persia at the time. 
Um, and I found these, which are, you have some of these, I believe, in museums in, in Vienna itself. These are plates from versions of the Akbar Nama. The Akbar Nama is an uh, illustrated folio, several illustrated folios that um, depict, celebrate, dramatize, and narrate the accomplishments that happened during the reign of the Mughal Emperor Akbar. And I think Akbar's sons also commissioned these kind of folios that were drawn to depict the spaces, the achievements, the buildings, the conquests, and um, the life. But it wasn't, I mean, these things, again, they're drawn from fantasy. The people who are drawing them have not been on those battlefields or in those courtyards where these things are happening. But um, they don't purport to talk about the rest of the world and then put Akbar's achievements in there. Right? They're not alongside a bunch of illustrations of Greek and Roman emperors and their achievements. Um, so I, I was really struggling to find a parallel of people who have, people outside of Europe, who maybe have given themselves the liberty, permission or bravery to talk about everywhere else. Um, and we do now, right? I think um, the current instances, the current events that we're living in, I think Sam was alluding to media and how we kind of live through it. Where, where do you feel unable to talk about um, as architects, as teachers of young people, I often feel very um, out of place when I'm talking about things that I don't know, and I'm grateful that I have 350 students who can bring all their equipment with them and all their knowledge with them. So together I feel more confident. But this figure of the architect who gives himself the authorial position of putting his own work alongside a synthesis, um, and again, as I think, uh, was it, previous speaker, or the one before, I'm forgetting names, who mentioned the sort of similarity of drawing and tone. It's, it's an intentional thing. These aren't habits. My therapist tells me there are no such thing as habits. Um, they're choices. Every time you choose to draw something, every time you choose to frame something, every time you put something next to something, it's a choice. So I'm, I'm really curious about the motivation behind these figures. And again, I can't really find anyone like Fisher even within a European history, although some of you have shown me some, even somebody like Salio, whose work I know much more, and who does insert his position, his practice into, let's say, a slightly more global um, thesis of what architecture is. He's trying to prove a thesis and trying to put forward an argument, which I don't think Fisher is, and again, that's so, so liberating. Um, so, uh, uh, one other example that I found in British architecture, this is an image that some of you might know of a cemetery. It's actually a sort of satirical image by Pugin of a new kind of cemetery. Um, I showed this to my students and um, I was explaining the various bits to them. That certain elements you can see are taken from Babylonian architecture, from Zoroastrian architecture, from, um, you can see an obelisk in the back there, and of course, some more classical and familiar references, um, <laughs> as well as the little cart with the coffin on it. Um, <laughs> and my students were thrilled. How great a non-denominational cemetery where we can rest together. But this was exactly the critique that Putin was making, that this would be awful if such a sort of eclectic architecture was made possible. And there is an ideal version of this drawing in which everything is a Gothic spire as per Putin's particular fetish. Um, so again, I couldn't really find this celebration of uh, like a range of, of um, architectures, whether imagined or experienced. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna pause on that there and go slightly into um, a sort of parallel discussion. This is a painting of Scheherazade telling the stories of the Thousand and One Nights to her king. I'm hoping that you all are familiar with the base story of A Thousand, uh, a thousand and One Arabian Nights. Sometimes it's just called A Thousand and One Nights. But the base story, um, and it's, it's not a story, it's not a collection of stories by a single author, it's a collection of folk tales that come from, I suppose, the Islamic world in the Middle Ages, which went from East Africa all the way to Far East Asia, and um, in various other places. So um, the basic story is that 
um, due to a rather lewd mistrust of women. Um, the king decides he's going to marry one woman each night and execute her the following day. And uh, Shahrazad, his chief advisor's daughter, says, let me take care of this. So she marries the king and uses her first night of marriage to start telling a story. And she doesn't finish her story. And he lets her live so that she can continue it and so on and so on for a thousand and one nights. Um, I like the idea of using narratives and fantasies to address urgencies. I think essentially that is what we're in the business of at the moment in producing architecture and even in producing architectural histories. But I think histories is the word that I wanted to bring to this slide. In my language, history is itihash, which means that which happened in Sanskrit. Um, but in the language that I suppose we're sharing in this room and in, in the title of Fisher's work, history relates to something much, much more slippery, right? Um, of all the languages that we have in the room, I don't know, historia, it's the same when you're making a story and when you're telling a history, right? And I think it's the same in, in French when you say histoire, you could be talking about the story, a narrative of something, as much as you could be talking about a, let's say, chronological, um, factually based um, arrangement of facts. So I think this is something that I enjoy in my own teaching, talking about the potential of stories and talking about the potential of stories to address urgencies and talking about the fact that stories themselves are not concrete, any history that my students read are, have been subject to the author's hand and the various socio-political and cultural um, as well as personal um, conditions that have affected them. And so, again, I'm interested in uh, the title, you know, the Entwurf of, forgive me, I'm not going to speak in German, but historic architecture. What is meant by that historic architecture? Is it an architecture that tells stories? It doesn't, the architecture that he's not telling a story, Fisher is not offering any kind of narrative or any solution, any way of reading as we've um, enjoyed in the presentations today. He's offering perhaps, um, as has been also mentioned, the possibility of storytelling. So um, for the rest of the sorbet, <laughs> I'm just going to go through um, something that I've been looking at for a piece of work that I'm, I'm doing. I've I've been long consumed by the fact that archives only contain certain histories, and it's only certain histories that I teach in my undergraduate survey course of architectural history. There's so much that doesn't fit in. There's so much that isn't studied, and there's so much work to do. That is what I'm excited by. Um, but this is just a little taster. So, I wanted to show you a few interpretations of A Thousand and One Nights that I found. And um, of course, very, very few of them originate from the Middle East, or even, let's say, the wider area where the folk tales that constitute A Thousand and One Nights come from. This one is English. And I think we can see, I don't know, I'm just interested in collecting these. I, I don't really have, like Fisher, I don't really have an overarching narrative for these. I just want to show them to you as a collection of interpretations as a means of telling stories, visualizations that are telling stories about places that the artists didn't know, um, people and figures and cultures that the artists didn't know. And therefore, there's a lot, I don't know, I find a lot of this liberty in these drawings. I mean, this is what it was about, really. Um, being a sort of colonial subject, I do wonder if the fascination with, um, let's say, oriental aesthetics has a lot to do with value. Um, but I'm fascinated by these, um, by these images and what they might have done in terms of what we understand of these cultures. Um, I think this is from the first version of A Thousand and One Nights that I did read. It was published by um, a British publishing house, but I, I received it in Kuwait, I used to live in Kuwait as a child. So it was really odd reading 
um, folk tales from the Middle East, in the Middle East, but published and illustrated by people from the West. Um, and trying to reconcile these imaginary landscapes with the culture that I was immersed in. And then, um, do you remember Aladdin being a Chinese story? Certainly when I read Aladdin as a little child, it was um, definitely set in a very particular period of Chinese history with very particular hairstyles and very particular hats and even the architecture that is being shown. Now that Aladdin is disputed as part of the original Thousand and One Nights, but again, the sort of liberty of interpretation. I mean, look at what's going on in this image. The, the, the sort of pink building on the left is not from where it's supposed to be. Um, and, well, you can see I'm not, I'm not a purist. I'm not necessarily advocating that people must only talk about that which they know. I'm actually um, very excited by these many interpretations of things that people have no, let's say, no right to talk about. Is that too provocative to say? Um, yeah, here's another image of um, Aladdin distinctly uh, depicted as um, somebody from the very Far East. Um, and then we have slightly more problematic depictions of the cultural other um, with elements that are taken from various other cultures. I remember growing up recognizing my own culture within some of these and then sometimes not and wondering what this was about. Um, that's Sinbad, I think. Sinbad, incidentally, the first time I heard of Baghdad it was many years before I then realized it was a real place where wars happen. And that was my other conception of Baghdad. I mean, what a strange perception of a place. Um, I guess I'm, I'm more and more questioning my own position in architecture and my own right to talk about and teach certain things as I understand that everything is so fragmented, so partial and so conditioned. And maybe you're all reconciled with this. I'm currently going through a period where I'm not quite. Um, I actually proposed this interrogation of narrative urgencies stemming from A Thousand and One Nights to, I was invited to pitch um, a curatorial proposal for the Sharjah Architecture Triennale. And when you're talking to three women from the Middle East, as I was, and you're presenting A Thousand and One Nights, you become deeply aware that this is a really problematic subject to deal with because it's a very eroticized um, uh, consumption, let's say, um, of the East that's going on. It would be like any of you approaching t me to talk about India and talking about the Kama Sutra. I would probably listen to you, but I'd probably be laughing inside. Um, the ladies on the jury were not laughing. <laughs> um, and I think couldn't quite see past the, the damage done by the Western gaze on A Thousand and One Nights. I think that was their issue. They were saying, we understand what you're saying about the potential of um, an urgent situation as Scheherazade had and using architectural narratives to address that. But I think they were so damaged by a Western perception of A Thousand and One Nights that they said, you know what, that, that has to go. And <laughs> so that didn't really work for me. Um, Again, I'm just, without really too much agenda, sort of showing you these and asking you to reflect what kinds of histories you've received and what kind of histories you have felt the liberty to create and inhabit and insert yourselves inside of. All of these images, I'm sorry, not all of these. I think some of these are probably from middle of Europe, where we are. Um, <laughs> various interpretations in pop culture, all of which take away from, let's say, a more faithful um, communal and folktale origin of what, what uh, The Thousand and One Nights really was, and they make it something much more consumable, exoticized, um, kind of made horrific in some ways, or made sexual. Um, whatever it is that people like to consume. Um, and again, I don't, I, I'm not equating Fisher to this, but I, personally, I have to say, I see a resonance in, in what's happening when people allow themselves the liberty to talk about whatever, and, and we are in that stage. We are allowed to talk about whatever. Um, interesting that these kind of cartoonish 
images were given to the Palestinian Authority at a certain time to make stamps. Um, all the rest of the images are Danish. I'm not quite sure why Denmark had such a huge fascination with A Thousand and One Nights. I think there was a first translation in something like 1911. And since then, there's been this huge, um, let's say, I, I hesitate to use the word appropriation, but um, a huge affection <laughs> for A Thousand and One Nights. And, and all of these images are by various Danish artists who have interpreted all of these. Sorry, I'm going to get to Kay Nielsen's ones. I suppose I, again, I'm repeating myself here, but I'm, I'm showing you these to reflect on a notion of cultural consumption. And perhaps that's a bit unfair to put on Fisher, but we're here now in 2022, and we are spending a day talking about his work. So I'm also curious to know what what we're doing by looking at this, um, as well as how we place ourselves in the world in our own work. Um, I think there's not a whole lot more I want to say, so I'll just show you the rest of the images and hope that we can perhaps pick up in group discussion after that. Is that okay? I hope that's okay. Let me just check my notes and see if I haven't forgotten anything. Um, I suppose I wanted to mention the work of um, Ariella Aisha Azule, who's an anthropologist and historian of photography, whose work you might know. Um, and I think she's documenting, or she has documented, the history of photography in terms of its use in, um, in Northern Africa. So when originally the French went into Northern Africa several hundred years ago, there were painters who went along to document what they saw and what they learned. And I think the, um, the later analyses were that if only we'd had photography at that time, it would have been a lot cheaper, we would have had to spend a lot less money to take away, extract from these places the information um, that was there. And I think, you know, um, that is something that happens with technological advancement. The, the opportunities for resource extraction are made faster and uh, more efficient, and that's kind of the point of it many times. But um, artistic interpretation and the sort of giving of importance to something for no real reason and with no real right, this is, I think, slightly more interesting. And um, again, I think we do it all the time. So I think I just wanted to leave you with that and hopefully be able to pick on pick up on that um, later on. Thanks for listening. That's all.